Um, today is the sun fourth Sunday of the, or some people consider it the fifth uh, Sunday of the Holy 50 Days. And as we have been kind of going through the theme of the whole 50 days of, of resurrection and life and um, seeing who the risen Lord is in our life. Like, for example, if you remember after the Feast of the Holy Resurrection, then we celebrate Thomas Sunday, um, the importance of faith and the relationship of faith and eternal life. And then the Lord starts using different examples in our daily life of describing him and eternal life. So like he's, he says he's the bread of life, right? And then he speaks of the water of life and the true worship with the Samaritan woman last Sunday. And this Sunday, what's the theme? He, he describes himself as the light of the world, right? Next week, he'll say he is the way, the truth, and the life. And then um, after or shortly before the Ascension Feast, um, he shows us the victory by saying that he has overcome the world. And uh, then we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. <clears throat> so in a sense, these holy 50 days should bring us to the clearer understanding of who God is, who what the resurrection is, and how to live with him in the resurrection now, not, not just after um, we pass from this world. <clears throat> so the unique thing about God is that um, we can't fully describe and understand who he is and his glory and his power and his light and his love and his majesty and, and the life that he gives. So that's why it takes so many descriptions, even in scripture, to describe God, and it's still that's not enough. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, today we try to contemplate on um, how God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And uh, as we get to know more the resurrected Lord and that he offers to us in the past, in the present, and in the future, um, we get to know a little bit more of, of how to, to live with him. <clears throat> um, there's so many verses we can label or, or recite regarding light and there's so many um, contemplations we can give like for example there's just one simple one that, that I read the other day about um, taking it from a physics point of view like one of the um, authors said he, he spoke with a PhD in physics and they told him that light is one of the only constants in the universe. Um, and he was saying, weight, measurement, sound, time, and so forth act differently in whatever physics, physics, physicists call different frames of reference. But there is a different relative, definite relativity of time and space in the created universe. But light acts the same way everywhere, just like God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this was a nice contemplation of, of one reason why God defines himself as light. Um, of course, based, in addition to all the other things that we read about in Scripture. Um, another good thing that we like um, to, to contemplate about is the, rela the relationship between the transfiguration and the resurrection. Right? In the transfiguration, the Lord appeared in glory, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes were as white as the light. And um, again, one of the authors says that the same light of the transfigured face of the Lord sh shined forth on the glorious day of the resurrection. <clears throat> and so, um, in a sense, we say that the transfiguration was a foreshadowing, no pun intended, of, of the Paschal mystery or of the resurrection of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> so today we'll just contemplate on a, a couple of verses um, that the Lord gives us today. So first of all, the Lord says, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become children of the light or sons of the light. And so if our goal is to become children of the light, there's some things we have to attain on, on the, the way by the grace of God first. Um, so the Lord says, first we have to believe. He says we have to believe in the light. Um, and he says, I have also I have come into, as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. So believing into, in him is not just a matter of, of faith by proclamation, but faith by lifestyle. That's why he says, um, whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Where are you? Are, are you living the resurrected life or are you abiding in darkness? 
And that's just a question each one of us has to ask ourselves. Right? <clears throat> um, after the, re the crucifixion, the disciples were shaken in faith. They didn't really know what to do. They ran uh, in, in hiding. Um, even before the crucifixion, uh, they did this. Um, <clears throat> and after the resurrection, uh, the Lord appeared to them um, once, right, as on, on the, the day, and then once the next week on Thomas Sunday. And after this, though, though according to what St. John Chrysostom says, um, the Lord was appearing to them and then disappearing from their eyes, even though he was continually present with them. He says, neither Christ was with them continually, nor was the Spirit yet given, nor were they at that time entrusted with anything, and so they had nothing to do. So they returned to their trade. They went fishing, right? Simon Peter said in John 21, I'm going fishing, and six other disciples said, we're, we're going with you also. Um, <clears throat> and uh, some people say, oh, that's because that was their trade beforehand. That's what they were doing beforehand. Or maybe it was because that was where... Um, they were transformed by the Lord. It's just the contemplation. Um, but others say the same thing about when the Lord tells them to meet them. Um, he, where does St. Mary Magdalene relay the message to tell the disciples to meet the Lord? It says, you will see him where? Jerusalem? Judea? Tabor? Where was the meeting place with the resurrected Lord for the disciples? Galilee. He said, Go to Galilee, and there you will see him. And some people say, well, why Galilee? Why couldn't it be the tomb, like with St. Mary um, Magdalene? Um, why couldn't it be uh, on the road, like with the two disciples on the way to Emmaus? But it had to be Galilee. Uh, and so some, um, again, theologians contemplate about this and say, maybe it's because this was where they had their greatest and first and most powerful encounter with the Lord. <clears throat> um, this is where they had their first zeal for their beloved. Um, one person says it's because the sweetness of their meetings were burning in their hearts. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and this is where he called many of them, right? Um, with the disciples, he said, I'll make you fishers of men, right? And they left their nets and followed him. That was it. Um, uh, <clears throat> but this was also where he lived with them most of the time where he performed miracles and a lot of his teachings happened in this place. Not all of them, of course, because he, he went around um, the surrounding region oftentimes. And he visited Jerusalem, as we know, uh, several times in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> but the idea here is this, is this was their home base. So he said, I'm going to meet you at home, at, at your home base, where you first met me. Um, and so the question that we have to pose to ourselves is, well, what is my home base? Where is the place where I am with the Lord? Where is the place, where is my Galilee, right? <clears throat> um, go to your Galilee, and then you, there you will see him. So many people say, yeah, it's the church. But what is it about your relationship with God that inflamed you with love for him at first? We have to go back to that place because sometimes we lose, um, we forget that love. Just like sometimes we say with marital uh, couples like in conflict one of the first questions that you know as a counselor they taught us to ask is well tell me a little bit more about how you met and how you fell in love and your first date why because yeah they're fighting about something else but remember why you, you decided to marry this person right <clears throat> so we have to do the same thing with our lord right because sometimes especially maybe now a days since we struggled in the past and we're enjoying the, the feast of the resurrection, sometimes we forget why, and we forget who this, this feast is about. Um, and, and that's why we can't forget our first love. Um, we need to reignite that spark of our heavenly bridegroom in our hearts. <clears throat> As uh, the Lord says to the Ephesians, remember in, in the book of Revelations, um, well, he doesn't say in the book of, so the church of Ephesus, right? What, in, in Revelation, we have the seven churches, and the seven messages to the seven leaders of, of the church. And the first one is to the city of Ephesus. And he says, I know your works, your, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil, 
and you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So at first he says, you're doing a great job. And I'm sure a lot of us might be doing a great job in our spiritual life. This is what God is saying. I know your patience, your tribulation. I, I know your prayers. I've heard your prayers. But this can always said about us while we're struggling in the flesh. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Um, the question we have to ask ourselves, how have I left my first love, or at least in part, and how and why and when? And then he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, and repent and do the first works. So this is the, the same message of going back to Galilee in, in our spiritual life. What was it about the Lord or about the church or about the spiritual life that attracted you at first? Was it the hymns? Was it the scriptures? Was it the rites? Was it um, the, the midnight praise? Um, was it just spending quiet time? What was it personally that, that attracted you to the Lord? And, and try to go back to that place every so often so you don't forget um, or leave your love uh, that uh, you so uh, loved in, in your early days. <clears throat> so what happened when the seven, seven disciples returned to Galilee in, in, uh, in Scripture? So again, the Lord appeared to them in the upper room and during, on the day of the resurrection. And then on Thomas Sunday, where's the third time? At Galilee. The third time was when they were fishing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, even after, so instead of, and they even, they caught a multitude of fish. Um, there's a lot of details we can, we can spare for now about the differences between this catch of fish and the others. Um, but the Lord was at the shore and they came back to him. They ate with him. And it says, St. John says, no one dared question who he was <clears throat> uh, uh, because they knew it was the Lord, right? Because they had gone to Galilee and he was just reminding them of, of who he, he was and what he did with them and what they need to do from now on. So um, this is kind of like, you know, because sometimes we get into Martha mode. Uh, we've talked about this before. We have Mary and Martha, the two uh, great beloved sisters of the Lord, and uh, or sisters of Lazarus, and, and friends of the Lord. Uh, and one was focused on at her responsibilities and her duties and uh, service, um, and the other just wanted to be at the Lord's feet. And inside of any, every one of us, like we said, we have both. Um, we have to do things, you know, um, not just for our daily life, but also in the spiritual life and in the service. Um, but also, we have to remember to sit at his feet and to behold the glory of the Lord. Um, and so, when it comes to believing, we have to also behold the origin, the scholar. He, he gives the comparison between, there's a difference between believing and beholding. It's not just a matter of semantics, but I'll just read to you what he says. He says, um, there's two aspects about the Savior. He says, first, believing in him, and second, what is above believing, that is to behold or to contemplate the word, and in beholding the word, to behold the Father. Right. So and he continues by saying, um, believing occurs even among the multitude of those who came to religion, but to behold the word and in him to regard the Father does not pertain to all who believe, but only to the pure in heart. He says, this is what he, and then he begins to explain, this is what he meant when he said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So we believe in God, but do you behold him in your life like Mary? Um, you, you might worship him like Martha, but in your heart of hearts, it, is it inflamed with him like Mary? Um, and so um, he says, I think time and training were needed in order to see Jesus and seeing the Son of God to behold also the Father. So it takes time. Um, and time and training are needed in our lives to behold the Holy Trinity in our lives. Um, just like in the resurrection appearances, they didn't recognize him at first. It took time and discussion sometimes, like with the 12 disciples, um, or uh, him revealing himself slowly again and opening their eyes so that they could behold the glory of God. 
Um, so it's okay sometimes if we don't behold him immediately. It needs patience and perseverance. Um, but uh, like, like he continues, it's, it's very possible to believe, but not to hold. Um, so uh, the question we ask ourselves, sometimes we believe you know, that God is good and God is the way and God is truth and God is life and God is the resurrection and God is joy and God is power. But in your life, do you feel that he is all of those things for you? Um, it's a question to ask, and our life and our actions should reflect that faith. We don't have to say yes, of course, but we review our actions to see, oh, in that situation, I didn't act in faith. Um, I, I just act, acted on my own. I didn't trust in God. I didn't feel that um, my sins were really forgiven, and so that's why I, I continue in the sin, or whatever, whatever the situation might be. So then the question is, what part of the light are you not beholding? Um, is it the life of prayer? Is it scripture? Is it confession? Or it might be something else. Um, <clears throat> but um, this is where the, the, the belief and the acceptance and the um, beholding of the glory of God is practically done in our life. Um, sometimes even it might be because we're afraid of the light. Um, Plato said we can e easily forgive a child um, if, if he's afraid of the dark. But the real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. It's, uh, it's, it's completely, sometimes we're afraid of coming to the light. We're afraid of coming to God and living the life that we know we should be living, uh, for one reason or another. <clears throat> um, but it's because, you know, when, when your light, your eyes are so accustomed to sitting in darkness, and then you come out into the light, it, it hurts. Um, there, there was one Orthodox father who, who was asked, um, I think it was a bishop, asked by the father, um, saying, you know, I don't understand how God, uh, who is so merciful, can allow people to go, um, to not be saved. Of course, it's by their choice. But they were sitting in, in a room, um, and, and it, I think it was very cold, like in Alaska or something, and the, the reflection of the snow was shining on the light of that father. It's like, so the light is shining on you. Um, <clears throat> and he said, okay, put down the shade. He's like, sorry, I don't have a shade. He's like, well, this is the experience of the, of the people who turn away from the light and, and are suffering because of it. The light is not darkness. Um, but this, this is the experience of the person who doesn't love God, who doesn't know God, and who enters the presence of God, it hurts them. Um, and, and they don't want to stay in, in this state. Um, so anyway, um, we said believing turns into beholding, and then beholding leads to becoming. It says, walk as children of the light, that you may become um, light, or children of the light. Um, as St. As Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, but we all with an unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So when we behold the glory of the Lord, what happens? He says, we are being transformed as the same image from glory to glory. So once we become, begin to bask in, in the glory of his light, it changes us to become light. Um, and the one who was attached, just like the, the um, example of the, the married couple, the one who is attached to another for years and years and years, they become like each other in personality. And sometimes even say, they say, they begin to look like one another. Um, one contemplation about that is, is like even the disciples towards the end when, when they were going to arrest the Lord in Gethsemane, um, they needed the sign for Judas to, to kiss him on the cheek because they all started to look like the Lord after a while. Um, one, one, uh, one father describes it that way. So the one who is attached to the light becomes like the light. One who is attached to God becomes God-like and Christ-like. Um, and sometimes, again, we see the spiritual life as things we need to do, like Martha. Um, but it's more like someone we need to become like. Is those, those things that we do should be transforming us from the inside to become more like Christ. 
um, on the inside. Um, <clears throat> and that's why like in the fraction that we'll create today, uh, we say, may we shine with your living, in, with your living image. Um, so that's the goal of our life is to believe, to behold, and to become um, the light. As, as that's why in the New Testament, the Lord says, you are the light of the world. Of course, he is the light, but we reflect his light because we become like him by his grace. Um, <clears throat> so if we need direction, if we need wisdom, if we need joy, if we need power, we get that from the light. But uh, we don't need to go far because we find him inside of us and through the Holy Spirit whom he has uh, placed in us um, <clears throat> and whom we will live with forever in the heavenly kingdom. May the God of glory give us the ability to walk as children of light that we may become uh, sons of him. Glory be to him now and for the stage of mercy. Then he